Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DOD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Hey everyone, thank you for joining this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIA. Before we get started, I'd like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSIA webinar announcement. You can go to cs.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say download presentation. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat window on the lower right hand side of the webinar screen. You can chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat. However, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, um, please click the icon labeled more slash panel options to bring up the Q&A window as part of your layout. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A for the benefit of those on the phone. I will also read the questions out loud to the presenter. Um, if you have any technical issues during the presentation, please have no fear. The full presentation and its recording will be online within a couple of days. Please check back to the CSI website. And once the webinar is posted, the go to webinar button will take you to the CSI YouTube page, which has the link. Uh, I'd like to now introduce uh, today's presenter. Uh, Mr. Javier Perez is a seasoned technology leader with over 27 years of experience in application development, cloud, open source software, mobile app security, AI, and software as a service. Uh, Mr. Perez is the Chief Open Source Evangelist, Senior Director of Product Management, and Open Logic Lead at Perforce Software. He is responsible for driving technical thought leadership and advocacy for open source software. Prior to his current role, he held several leadership positions with IBM, Veracode, Axway, and Red Hat. He holds an honors degree in computer systems and also has an MBA. Javier. Philip, thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction yes. and, and thanks for the uh, inviting me here. I think you can see my slides. We're good to go, right? Yes. Excellent. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening. Um, a pleasure to be here. Um, when I received the, the invitation, I said, Excellent. I'd be more than happy to share with, with this community, um, you know, what I've been working on uh, around open source, uh, been spending the last probably 10, 15 years uh, working directly on open source software, and then it worked uh, more on the security side of things. So, on open, so especially around open source security. And now with uh, everything we're hearing around uh, generative AI, I said, well, why don't put together a presentation that talks about all these three things, open source, open source security, and, and AI, especially around generative AI, and, and my thoughts about that. And, you know, that's something that I feel uh, all these uh, technologies, uh, especially around open source, which are everything, right? Everything based on open source. Um, it, it's something that I really enjoy, um, you know, reading, 
keeping up uh, with the latest, uh, participating in some of the, the communities, uh, and of course, have had a chance to be able to, to speak to you, right? And, and you know, share some of my my comments. So with that, just heard my introductions. There, uh, these are my contact details. Uh, happy to um, uh, get in touch and, and chat more about um, you know what you're gonna hear here. And obviously, also happy to to be part of uh, you know other sessions and um, you know events events like this. Um, so with that, I'm going to start, and I always like this slide, just to set the scene of uh, where are we in terms of open source software. Now, when we talk about open source, uh, we're talking about not thousands, but actually millions of open source software out there. And to prove you that, uh, here are some numbers, right? If you are not familiar with these um, major repositories, uh, we have NPM, where it's mainly uh, JavaScript, Node.js uh, code out there, packages available to anyone. Uh, Maven for Java, PyPy for Python, Backlist for uh, PHP, Nugget for C Sharp, uh, Ruby Gems for Ruby. And you can see the numbers there in blue. Uh, for example, the NPM registry has more than 2.7 million packages out there. And then the number you see uh, uh, below there, it's actually even more impressive because it's actually new packages per day. And, and you can get these numbers at, uh, you can see at the, the bottom right, the source, uh, modulecounts.com. They have APIs that connect to those uh, repositories. So they have actually the up-to-date information. Um, and I like to update this slide from time to time. In fact, uh, uh, just just last Friday, I, that's when I updated this. So so the numbers are pretty pretty recent, and then don't forget that you know not all it's these are just the registries, right? But the code is also available in places like GitHub and and other public repositories. Uh, in fact, GitHub has now over a hundred million users, right? They have more than four hundred and fifty million repositories. So. Um, very sizable space now, right? Everything, and I am happy to say that everything is now based on open source software. No one starts from scratch, right? And we're going to talk about that uh, in a few minutes, but you know, no one really starts coding from scratch anymore. How many libraries are, are out there? Uh, how many uh, available information? And it's all the kind of like the power of being open source, right? Now, if you see on, on this slide, now there's the script, the piece of code that I can open source and make it available in my GitHub repository, uh, but there are also the larger open source projects, right? Um, a good way to, to kind of see which ones are the most popular or the most um, used open source technologies, uh, a good way to see it is, well, maybe let's check what they're foundations, the open source foundations are doing. Um, the top three foundations, the, la the largest foundations are the Linux Foundation, which is more like a, an umbrella of other foundations, uh, the Apache Software Foundation and the Clips Foundation. So you can see the, number, the, the amount of numbers, the amount of projects, uh, open source projects that they have, right? Part of the Linux Foundation, we have um, two uh, rapidly growing uh, foundations, communities, like the CNCF, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and OpenSSF, Open Source Security Foundation. Uh, they're getting more and more uh, members, uh, contributors, uh, sponsors, and of course, more, more open source projects that they can drive, that they can, you know, the, the nice thing about the foundations is that they have a place for um, uh, a framework for governance. Right? It's not just one company driving one open source project or making all the decisions. They're, they're more, uh, they have a, a framework to formalize these projects, to host them sometimes first as an incubator and then kind of as a graduated project and, and with a community, with some governance. Uh, so it's not just one company making all the decisions, right? So important, important piece here, what uh, important work, what, what it's done in, in these foundations. Uh, but the point that I want to make here is, okay, we talk about thousands and millions of open source software out there, projects. 
Um, probably the most uh, popular, the most used are somewhere between 1500 and 2000 projects, many of them part of these open source uh, foundations, right? So, you know, uh, let's start with the basics, right? And I think everyone here in the audience knows what open source software is, and or they, you've been using open source software for for a, for a long time. Um, here you see on the slide, uh, you know, kind of a quick definition. Let me highlight a couple of things first uh, to make sure that we are all on the same page, right? Yes, the source code is publicly available. Yes, it's open to collaboration, you know, nice thing that you can go and uh, start contributing and, you know, learn and be part of be part of that open source project. Um, that's great. Most people know that. Um, but let's, let's talk about the other two points quickly. Um, the open source license allows you to go and use that software, right? And very important, use, run it, modify it, redistribute. Uh, but one important piece here that not everyone knows or realizes is if the software does not have an open source license, license file that explains the gives you basically permission to use it or distribute it and so on if doesn't have the license is not open source right might be free might be available but it's not open source so you know there's obviously always the risk of you know the owner of that code come going back to you especially if you're commercializing software or you're using uh, as part of a, some regulation or compliance right so very important distinction there has to have an open source license file. That license should exist. If not, it's not open source. And then the last point, uh, freedom to deploy it anywhere. And you heard on the news uh, recently about some um, commercial organizations changing open source licenses. And you know, that's another completely separate webinar. <laughs> I can spend another two hours talking about that. But But the point here is, if you are restricting, if the license restricts you to host the software, um, then it's no longer really open source, right? Uh, it has some, some important restrictions there. It might be source available. Redis is the latest one. Redis uh, made news last week. Uh, before that, HashiCorp and Elasticsearch before that and a few others. Not many, by the way, uh, no more than 10 in 10 years. Uh, but they make news because they change the open source licenses. And, and the common threat here is just to protect themselves against the cloud vendors, right? The, the, the AWS or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud, which they can use that software and then host it and, and make a big business out of that. So, you know, from the organization perspective, in the case of Redis or HashiCorp, HashiCorp they say, well, Let's change the license why you know it's not hosted there uh, but it's no longer really open source right and then you have the forks you heard about the forks right in open source you can take the source code and do whatever you want with it right so you can fork to a different branch and then start a new project right and happen that with a open uh, elastic search a fork now called open search is gaining a lot of traction um terraform now has a fork called open tofu and that open tofu is also gaining a lot of a lot of users. So a lot of things happening in the in the open source today. But let, let's just want to start here with the with the with the basics, right? And you know, one key piece of um, uh, open source, of course, is all these dependencies, right? Your code depends of libraries, which depend of other libraries, and open source it's built with other open source, which is built for another open source, and you see the you see the change there, right? Depending on the programming language, uh, it could be not from hundreds to even thousands of dependencies in, in any, any given project, right? Um, and, you know, by the way, this is the other important piece to clarify. This is not just for open source. It is for all proprietary software is actually using open source software, right? There, the, the code is probably coming from Java or JavaScript or, or Python, and they have exactly the same issue or the same situation in terms of the dependencies of the libraries. So why do I mention that? Because that's when we start talking about security, that's the key. When we talk about open source security, that's the that's the where it complicates things, right? That is not what you're using, but 
that what you're using depends on other open source software, which also depends on other open source software. So here's a quick example. Uh, I, I updated this, uh, these numbers um, in November, so now it's been a few months, but, but you can go to uh, the Maven repository and actually update the numbers there. Um, in this example, uh, a very popular, heavily used uh, Java library called Apache Commons IO. Uh, the number that you see there is 26,486 other artifacts, meaning other open source software are using this library. And then one of them, for example, on the, on the, on the right, uh, SpringWeb, 8,400 8, 8, 8, other artifacts are using SpringWeb, which is using also Apache Commons IO library, right? So you see the chain of open source being, used, being created with other open source that is created with other open source and so on. Uh, let me highlight here on the left, if you can see my icon, Apache Log4j. Many of you probably heard about the Apache Log4j, right? The big um, um, vulnerability and exploit uh, actually two years ago now, it was December two years ago. Um, Log4j also uses Apache Commons IO. And then there were back in November another more than 10,000 other open source software identified as using Log4j. So you see the chain, and this is just with, with Java, right? Uh, here's another example on JavaScript, a lot more. JavaScript is a lot more on, there are a lot more uh, like smaller pieces of code, uh, more smaller uh, libraries, and therefore you have a lot more dependencies. So this one, if you can see there on the center, Lodash, Lodash is one of the most popular, if not the most popular library used everywhere for other, other many other things. So things get really, really complicated, right? So when we talk about open source security, uh, it, let's, it's beyond those vulnerabilities, right? So let me just uh, make it easier to understand, like simplify it. Uh, it's about vulnerabilities, right? It's about those CVEs when a vulnerability is disclosed, uh, an ID is assigned, right? The CVE, the Common Vulnerability and Exposure. Um, then that uh, vulnerability gets uh, the National Vulnerability Database assigns a score that CVSS, that Common Vulnerability Score System is assigned from zero to 10, 10 as the most critical ones. And of course, anything up above seven, seven and higher would be considered high severity vulnerabilities, four to seven minimum severity. And, and there's this registry of uh, vulnerabilities where they are disclosed and is the National Vulnerability Database. By the way, um, there's uh, a lot of chatter, there's a lot of discussion in recent weeks because the National Vulnerability, it's having some major delays in terms of disclosing CVEs. Um, that's has, it's been a problem forever, right? How, how can one just single place can keep up with so many vulnerabilities? And let me also clarify that it's not that there are more vulnerabilities because the code is worst. There are more vulnerabilities because people are now disclosing, right? So it's a good thing, a practice of disclosure. Uh, as a consequence of that, obviously we have more vulnerabilities. And, and as we talked about AI in just a second, uh, that's exactly the same same situation. Now, another key point here on when we talk about open source security is, you know, what about those vulnerabilities that have not been disclosed, right? That the public doesn't know yet. <laughs> that's that's where the issues uh, can really really arise. Now, there's another um, there's another piece here of on on open source security. Um, and it's it's the, the malware, right? When we talk about uh, you know um, the the bad actors kind of getting into those libraries and those dependencies, and they have different techniques to basically mask or or make their malware part of their what looks like normal standard dependency libraries, right? And there are different techniques that they use that um, you know like post-squatting or uh, masquering or uh, a Trojan package or dependency confusion, just on the confusion on the names. Um, so there are different ways to do it. I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, 
you know, that's obviously a, a way to 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 infiltrate or, or get access. Um, I'm going to leave that uh, aside for a moment to focus more on the on the vulnerabilities. At the end of the day, when someone uh, gets in, it's uh, and exploits a vulnerability. That's that's obviously a major major piece. If you infiltrate through these um, you know techniques uh, with with malware. Um, obviously, they, they're going to be providing some action, not necessarily exploring a vulnerability, right? Um, you know, the key thing with vulnerabilities is that they keep being, that's a good thing, that they've been disclosed, right? So the vulnerabilities are found all the time, right? And that's that's an ongoing situation, right? That means that security uh, tooling and, you know, security teams should constantly, it's not like you go, you do a scan and you fix what needs to be fixed and you're done, it, it's constant, right? It, it is constant and the more you can automate it, the better. And uh, that's when people talk about not only Dev, DevOps development and operations, but DevSecOps, right? So um, providing your tooling and, and your security earlier in the development life cycles, what some people call shifting left earlier in the development life cycle and do that uh, or in, in an automated fashion, right? Um, the other key point that I want to mention here is that it, this is very important to clarify. In my estimate, and I used to work also for a, an application security organization, uh, more than 95% of all those public vulnerabilities already have a fix, right? Because the, the smart way to do it, the right way to do it is you identify a vulnerability, you work on the fix, and then you disclose, you let the, pro, the open source project know and with with the fix right so you know you then it gets this close it gets it's announced you know once there's it's in a release right or in a patch or a minor, minor release or a patch saying here's the vulnerability and here's how you fix it so this is important right because if you're new to, uh, into into this you might think well no i'm not going to use open source no well the majority of this vulnerability the vast majority and it could be a lot actually even more than 95 percent, probably more a lot more uh, close to 99.9% that they have a fix already, right? Or, or, and that's a good thing, right? I'm going to stick with the 95, and this is just my estimate based on, on what I'm reading. But, uh, but you know, there's a, there's also the zero-day vulnerabilities, right? The vulnerabilities that don't have a fix immediately. Going back to the two-year-old example of Log4j, uh, it was actually a weekend, maybe about two days before there was a, a fix, a workaround fix. Right, so it was like technically zero day for a couple of days, uh, and the issue is not the fix. The issue is all the organizations, everyone finding if they are using Log4j in their Java applications and then apply the patches. Right, that that was more of the issue, not if there was a fix or or not. So he, let me tell you another example, uh, and this is a, a quite interesting. Some of you might remember this one uh, back in 2017. Right, the Equifax breach, and and there are a couple of reasons why I want to mention this quickly, is because um, really all this awareness, uh, there's more and more awareness, and now even uh, government-led initiatives around open source security, all started here in 2017, and one of one of, was one of those cases where you know now oh wake up call right, we need to do something, we need to monitor all these open source li libraries and all these. Um, vulnerabilities in open source software and dependencies. So, so what happened? Just quick, quick, quick re, uh, refresh. Um, the Equifax breach, right? There was a major breach on Equifax um, here in here in the U.S. and the private records, financial records, and private information of close to 150 million Americans were compromised. 150 million Americans, like major, major breach, right? Since then, there have been another, other bigger ones uh, globally. Uh, there was a huge one in India, and there were some, some there in many other places, right? But at the time, you know, obviously here in the US, a uh, huge one, right? 150 million people affect, uh, comp with their data compromised. And it was an exploit on an open source library called Apache Strots, Java Strots. And turns out that as I mentioned just uh, a minute ago, uh, that, that vulnerability already had a fix, already had a patch, 
So, so the issue here was really with Equifax not patching Apache struts, then they got the, the bad actors exploring that vulnerability. Um, it took a few years, the, the, all this, uh, and then at the end it was a um, $300 million settlement with FTC uh, on Equifax for the, the, the compensate uh, people. Um, I was one of those, right? Obviously, like many of us, many most people listening here, that their data was compromised by by this breach. So since you know it was in the open source space, it was the first time that it was like big news on on a, on a, an open source library Apache Struts. I followed this, and then when it finally reached the settlement a few years later, I entered my name, and you know I won my piece of that three hundred million dollars, right? Well, uh, you know, almost and uh, it's anecdotal, but it's it's almost la it's laughable here. Here's my check. Out of this three hundred million dollars, I got five dollars and twenty one cents. <laughs> so I don't know who got all those three hundred million dollars. Uh, um, lawyers, or I don't know. But uh, I and you can see that at the at the top, right? Equifax Bridge Settlement Fund. I got my five dollars. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's move into um, AI and how this relates with open source and security, right? And um, yes, uh, chat GPT is in the news and, and it took the world by storm uh, just a few months ago, right? Or yeah, I mean, basically a year ago. And uh, and in it reached the 100 million users in the first two months, right? And now kind of stabilized, stabilized around 150 million, right? And of course, there's competition. And if you haven't tried Copilot, I'm talking Copilot, the Microsoft Copilot, not GitHub Copilot, which is a little bit different. Um, you know, you can do basically the same, right? You have a prompt, and you can ask questions, and you can ask for things to do for you, or document, or explain, and so on. Uh, uh, Google uh, uh, just renamed Bard for to Gemini. Gemini. Um, I think still a lot of commentation there with Bard, so I left the, the name there in the slide, uh, but it's now called Gemini. Uh, Hoeing Chat is another one. Uh, uh, I've, I've been using it pretty good, and it gives you actually different, very different information. Obviously, it comes from, uh, I believe it comes from uh, the uh, Llama uh, uh, LLM, uh, whereas the Microsoft more with Open, open, open AI, uh, ChatGPT, obviously, from, from the GPTs from OpenAI, uh, Google doing its own thing, Amazon doing its own thing, it's called Amazon Q. So there's a lot of competition out there, right? It's not just uh, ChatGPT. And, and let me show you here a quick example. My prompt was just write a basic code of user authentication in Python. That, that was what I wrote on the prompt, right? Write, a basic, write basic code for user authentication in Python. And as you can see there on the, sli on the slide, uh, you know, I got it, by the way, I got it in basically two seconds, right? Chat GPT on Copilot and in Hohen Chat, completely different code to do the same. Uh, the Copilot was the longest one. So it's, it's, it was, it's a little bit more than, than what you see there on, on the screen. Uh, but isn't this wonderful, right? I mean, when I talked about open source and uh, saying that nobody, uh, no one starts from scratch anymore, uh, because their libraries, but the tooling. Um, well, now you have here uh, a more modern, better, complete tool, right? And in a matter of seconds can do a good part of the of the work for you. Uh, but th this, of course, you're already thinking, well, no, I mean, it sounds too good to be true, right? Let, what about these other issues? So, so let me let me address that. Let me talk about, and I'm going to, I'm talking from open source software perspective. Uh, but also from the security perspective, when using these 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 tools. Um, by the way, GitHub uh, Copilot is a little bit different, right? Here is not GitHub Copilot is basically helping you to to code, you know, complete your your syntax, give you information about vulnerabilities. Uh, it is embedded there on your IDE. So it's more of a code or assistant, right? Uh, and in fact, Gartner just published last week uh, a report about AI code assistance. So that's a little bit different category, 
uh, which would be uh, great for you and your organization to to be part of it. Um, here I'm talking about more on the you know the standard generative AI, you know, based on prompts, right? Um, so let's talk about let's talk about um, let's talk about some of the some of the concerns and then uh, some of my thoughts about that, right? So the first one is um, you know valid, valid, validity of the code, right? So you know I get that code. You saw the example. How's that? Gonna fit within my old my application, right? Um, it's really no. I mean, yes, it helps me with some ideas, but it's it's not something that I can copy and then paste on on the rest of my my applications. Um, and then, you know, are you really gonna re rely rely on AI generated code? Um, my response to that, uh, you know, I just just mentioned, right? So developers. Um, cannot take AI generated code as final word, right? And this is no different to taking the code from Stack Overflow or GitHub or NPM or other proprietary software where you have access to, you know, we've been doing this for forever, right? We reuse, we adapt, and, and it's not a final, it's not a copy paste. So that's the first thing, you know, people uh, in general needs to, to to be, see it in that perspective, right? It's it should be just your baseline or you know a system. It, is, it cannot be the final piece, right? So that that's to set the set the scene. Um, the next concern is around training data, right? Machine learning, deep learning models. Uh, the, the consensus is that the training should be must be fair, robust, and explainable. Right, and it's very, very important, right? Otherwise, as I said, they are garbage in or garbage out, right? So, um, it's very, very important the data, right? And if the language model uh, was done with the wrong data or limited data, or maybe maybe too much data that that it creates some confusion, then there's an issue, right? Then there's an issue. So, absolutely, AI generated code uh, cannot be considered perfect. In fact, it's not perfect. For some basic things like user authentication, what I was showing you, yeah, it may be perfect for that. But um, anything more advanced, you should take it as uh, any other source of, of code. Of course, the advantage here is that you can get it in a few seconds, right? Rather than going and searching every, in other places and spending hours looking for some help on the code here you can get it in in seconds um but at the same time taking advantage of these new tools you can also get uh to uh, generative ai to explain you code or to comment code or to generate test cases for you to generate some dummy data for you so should you see the, the benefits here right yes not the training data is hugely important, uh, but the response is like, let's take advantage of everything else, all the other functionality that, that offers this, right? The next one is uh, ownership, right? So can I use and, dis and distribute AI generated code? What about license compliance? So the first thing, and this is coming from, from one of our, an expert lawyer in open source software, says like, well, the code that you, that it prompts to you, that's not, uh, copyrightable uh, code, right? Uh, and in fact, some some of you might heard like uh, maybe there's this one or two or maybe more than now uh, lawsuits uh, uh, suing because you know it apparently was a copy of their code that what the generative AI tool produced. Um, a couple of lawyers are saying experts on on open source uh, they're not gonna they're not gonna win they're not gonna make any progress why because your code is very unlikely to be uh, having a copyright on your code, right? Uh, even if you show that it's almost identical, well, if your code is not copyrightable, you're gonna have a problem trying to win that, that those cases. But the point here is, and also people need to uh, realize that it's not a copy paste situation. It is uh, processing millions and millions of transactions, in this case, lines of code, and with that be able to generate code, code for you. So it's not copyrightable. Uh, it most likely is not going to be a copy paste. 
Um, and 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 that's the you know again it's not gonna be you should not consider the code gen, uh, AI generated code as the final state right uh, or copyrightable. Um, some of the organizations, some of the companies, and I want to kind of highlight here uh, a couple of them. Um, they're actually saying, well, yes, that's a concern for people. Well, let's let's cover for them, right? So uh, Microsoft is basically, I'm, I'm going to read it to you, what Microsoft said. Uh, basically, Microsoft, uh, uh, to address that concern, Microsoft, uh, when announced, uh, they announced what they call the Copilot Copyright Commitment. And, and I'm going to read it to you. It says, as customers ask whether they can use Microsoft Copilot services uh, and the output they generate without worrying about copyright claims, uh, we are providing a straightforward answer. Yes, you can. And if you are challenged on copyright grounds, we will assume responsibility for the potential legal risks involved. So Microsoft feels very comfortable that they're going to win all those cases, right? So making this a copyright commitment to the customers. Amazon uh, is doing the same. Um, uh, uh, Google, it's also have some, some something similar. There's something called Do It AI, uh, Google Do It AI. And uh, uh, also they have a statement like that. I'm going to read it to you quickly. It says, you can rest assured that your code, your inputs and recommendations will not be used for any product or model learning uh, and development. Your data and IP remains exclusively yours, right? Which is the other aspect saying, well, if I have some data there, they're going to use it for uh, for their train their, their models. Uh, mainly on the paid versions is where they're not going to use. If you use the the free version, uh, yeah, be careful, right? Don't obviously do not uh, provide any personal confidential information in 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 those prompts, right? Just just common sense. Um, just make sure that you have a, a paid version and you have uh, approval from uh, your legal team um, if if um, you know if to start using um, you know these prompts and to generate code and so on. By the way. Um, the Cyber Maryland conference uh, a few months ago, um, we had a panel and, and they were two from three different companies and they were asking them about the, the use of generative AI. And this were CISOs, Chief Information Security Officers. One said, no, we're not allowed in chat GPT or any like that. The other one said, we're evaluating uh, the policy. Um, so some, you know, people have to request access and we provide on a case by case uh, we allowed our employees to use generative AI uh, or generative AI tools. And then the third one said, well, we are actually working with the vendor um, to use uh, like a commercial version. So, so we, we feel more, more protected, right? So just, just gives you an idea, the, the approach, approach there. And then the, the fourth uh, concern is about job displace, displacement, right? Uh, AI tools are going to make developers jobs redundant. Do, do you really think that? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, it, it can help. It's going to be a. It's it's. They are already a big help. Great tools. Um, but uh, anyone that it's been testing this, uh, as long as you get into a more, little bit more detail, um, a lot more uh, technical, uh, you you could see the inaccuracies. You can see the unreliable co code or, or or content, right? And there's people that are actually uh, becoming experts on how to. Uh, Confuse uh, AI, right? And so, no, we're far, far away. Uh, but this again should be considered a tool, right? And 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 I will always talk that, you know, in, in anything, not just in software, the better the tools that you have, the better you do your job and 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 faster, right? Whatever you're doing, if you're doing, you know, carpentry and woodworking. Yes, you might need some talent and you might need some uh, uh, expertise, uh, just like software. Uh, but if you have better tools, you do a better job or a faster job, right? There's no question about that. So I, I, def I definitely encourage, you know, within the guidelines of your organization to 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 try and, and take advantage. And if it's not to generate code, as I said earlier, to explain the code, to document code, to provide test cases and so on. Again, obviously very careful on the information on your prompts, right? You don't want any uh, private or, or confidential information there. It's just common sense, right? Uh, security. So 
let, let, let's go back to security, right? Um, is the AI generated code going to ensure these vulnerabilities? Well, possibly, right? As I've been mentioning, it is not necessarily uh, perfect, right? So yes, you should treat this as any other pieces of software that you take from other sources. Make sure that that you run your uh, security scans that make sure that you identify, try to identify uh, vulnerabilities, uh, even um, static analysis on the code. So really, really important um, uh, to treat it just like any any other software, right? Uh, so yes, there's there's the possibility of introduction of, of new vulnerabilities. Now, again, I was talking. I'm talking about here, you know, the generative AI tooling. I know, uh, for example, GitHub Copilot that it's helping you actually to identify vulnerabilities. So great, right? Even better, even better, better tooling. Um, you can also ask about a specific CVE, and it will give you the description and the information. You can actually also ask to explain a potential vulnerability or potential uh, specific, yeah, specific vulnerability, things like cross-site scripting or, you know, um, memory overflow, and and you will get a good answer. You will get a, you know, you know much improve what you get from a Git, uh, Google search. You, you'll get a good information, good answer, right? So um, take advantage of the, take advantage of the, of the tools. Um, educational, of course, you know, people can say, well, you know, kids are going to uh, um, just just use generative AI, uh, but it, it could be uh, as a great source of uh, uh, information and uh, just books. I don't know if you try, but you can ask ChatGPT or some of the others to recommend books, uh, programming languages, goods, or, or even Translate from one lang programming language to another can do that actually. <laughs> so pretty amazing help with with most powerful powerful tools. Um, so security concerns, right? So as I said, um, you know you should treat the code, gener AI generated code, as any other code. You have to uh, scan it. You have to. It's not a final version. You have to include it in your in the rest of your code. A um, <clears throat> couple of other aspects are. Uh, the phishing attacks, right? Um, you know what we're finding, and, and this is this is not new. I think we're seeing it uh, mentioned multiple times. You know those phishing emails, uh, typically coming from foreign actors, right? And with the with having generative AI, now they can write in proper English, right? Like achieve fluency in English, right? So. Uh, While well, before you see something written that isn't doesn't sound doesn't look good that you know a bit of a broken English you say well that's a phishing I'm I'm gonna ignore that I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna touch that email or I'm gonna report or block that email well there are now more sophisticated uh, uh, emails right and yes it could it's it you know pretty good with the help of of generative AI um, the malicious code I mentioned earlier. Um, this is actually interesting, right? So they say, what about if AI helps me write some some malware? Um, in general, uh, and I can speak for reading from Amazon and Google and, and uh, Meta, uh, former Facebook, uh, Microsoft and others, IBM and others, you know, they're obviously not allowing their models or their um, generative AI tooling to produce malware, right? Uh, but always, there's always a, a way to go work around that or fake that, or at least give you some initial steps into creating malware. So yes, there are concerns about that, although the companies responsible for, especially these large language models, are, are definitely taking um, uh, important steps there to avoid that, right? Um, so yes, you, you're not supposed to create, and, and you're not, not allowed you to create malware uh, from generative AI. Uh, now, and this brings me to the security on those large language models, right? Um, and it could be smaller language models as well. Um, you know, they need to be inspected, right? The, the data, uh, and it's just similar to any other binary, right? Can be inspected. You can apply security 
practices to them. Um, obviously, the model depends on the data set. Uh, and again, if there's an influence on that data set, that could be a problem. And, um, you know, Twitter, now X, that's a good example, right? Where uh, years ago they figured out that, you know, sending too many uh, messages in one way, they uh, changed the algorithm to now share information with that specific topic or political subject and, and so on. And that, those are kind of ways to influence and, and you know, create bias on the models, right? So yes, that, that's an important piece on the security of your models. Um, you know, training, right? Challenge, uh, challenging or unavailable training steps and, and training data, that's, that's the key. Uh, and then, you know, the fact that models can be downloaded from, from any place or like Hogging Face becoming now the, the big player there, the repository of uh, AI related uh, models and, and code. Well, you know, that means that people can, you know, download and then uh, make available something that is not, uh, or that might have some, some issues, right? So yes, the models can, you know, you can affect the models or the bad actors can, can affect the models and, and there's definitely something to keep an eye on. I, I will just say, you know, just, just treat them like, like, like you're treating all your other software, right? With all the, the precautions and security scans and, and uh, security access required for, for all of that. Um, here, here are some of the, in the, uh, in the case of the prompts, right? So generative AI, you have the prompt and you, you ask the question or you ask, you, you have the instruction there. There's, there's also some risk there, right? Um, they, they, bad actors can manipulate those, those prompts, uh, and, and basically trying to inject or, yeah, create the, the bias there on, on the models. Um, they can try to access your data and, 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 and affect or change your data. Um, even data leakage is, it could be a, an issue. You probably heard the term hallucinations, and that's when the AI models start, you know, giving you some information that is completely not relevant or completely different, uh, or yeah, yeah, really different. Um, that's that's when that's when the models, you know, start getting getting affected. Not necessarily could be for a from a bad actor, by the way. <laughs> it could be just just you know they it's not uh, an optimal stage, right? The model, and that's why they have to keep training and retraining those those models and making sure. So obviously, data scientists and and there's a big area of uh, research there, uh, plenty of work to do. But just like any other software, right? Like there's plenty of work to do on any any on any other software. Um, getting close to the the, the end of the, the session here, let me just just finish with a couple of things there. Um, yes, uh, I want to say that if AI generated code can assist bad actors, uh, remember that this same power is equally available to the good actors, right? And 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 taking advantage of generative AI to you know help you also to provide some guardrails or some software that protects you and, you know, many, many other options. Um, going back to the vulnerabilities, right? Because that's what you want to protect. Um, you know, the, the, rec the recommendation always, everyone basically talks about this. It's, you know, make sure you have your security education, right? Education is important, but, and make sure you have your security champions. You're not going to have security experts of, on every engineering team, on every development team. Uh, but try to have one or two or a few champions that can help the others, right? And instruct and train the, the others. Um, if you are not familiar with the OWAS top 10, top 10, those are the, the most common types of vulnerabilities. All developers, all software engineers should know about the OWAS top 10. And here's the list of a uh, quickly uh, list of the top 10. And then there's obviously a lot in, within each one of them, um, but uh, they're, they're training, there's a lot of material out there. OWASP is an organization that has been around for many years um, and uh, very, very important for your developers to, to be familiar with that. So they don't create, um, their code doesn't have vulnerabilities of these types, right? So very important re recommendation. Uh, in terms of identifying the vulnerabilities in open source software or 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 the code generated by AI, um, this this I call it here scanners. Commercially, it's called software composition analysis, and it's basically uh, reading the code, identifying the open source libraries 
and then cross reference that with a list of uh, the CVEs, right? The public list, if they have a vulnerability or not. When do the, they do those scans, it, they generate a, a software bill of materials, SBOM, right? And it's good good practice to have your up to date SBOMs and do security scans to uh, obviously identify if you have any high severity vulnerabilities and address those high severity vulnerabilities, applying the corresponding the corresponding patch, right? Um, there are commercial options and there are also free or open source uh, security scans. Uh, here I'm just listing a few. Uh, or WASP dependency checker, the dependency tracker. So they're to, to checker and tracker. Um, you can do it with an NPN audit. You know, the, obviously the commercial versions have some additional functionality and user interface and and uh, and, and even improved databases. Uh, but there are definitely also uh, free or or, uh, or open source versions there. Um, good practice I mentioned to generate uh, uh, SBOMs, right? In, in fact, you know there are uh, especially here in the U.S. different government-based initiatives that are actually mandating the generation of SBOMs on on all uh, government agencies, right? Um, that QR code brings you to a, a recent blog post that I published where I talk about recommendations on tooling for SBOMs, especially around open source tooling, which is the ones that you are listed there on the on the screen. And then the final piece to, to, to share with you, uh, or almost final piece to share with you, is the, um, the vulnerabilities databases, right? So National Vulnerability Database, it's the main one. Uh, as I mentioned right now, it's, it's having some major delays. Nobody knows exactly what's going on. Um, but there are others as well. Uh, you can check some other uh, um, advisories or databases where you can go and, and check around vulnerabilities. To finish that, to finish this, uh, you know, another important security consideration is of end of life software. End of life software means, especially in open source everywhere, uh, that no more releases, right? So it's end of life you're not going to receive any more releases, any more patches, any more updates. So when there are more newer disclosed vulnerabilities, then your software is at risk, right? So uh, some of the big ones, uh, there are many. Uh, AngularJS went end of life now two years ago. Uh, you need basically to rewrite your apps. This, there's not really a migration path. CentOS, CentOS, uh, reach end of life version 6 and 8. Version seven is going end of life at the end of June, um, so you, you don't want to be your have your deployments, your software on end of life software because you are going to be at risk of newly disclosed vulnerabilities. Right? PHP, there are some older versions of PHP also end of life, and, and you can go on and on and see other software that reach end of life. Not not the software, but the version, and then you have to make sure that you are on the latest versions. In the example of Angular JS and CentOS, they they were actually end of life, right? No no more. Newer, newer versions, uh, and also very important to to um, you know try to understand where the the origin of of the soft the software the open source software you're using um, the AI generative AI tooling some of them are starting to provide tags or information where this is coming from that's a, that's good and if you're just taking open source software from other sources uh, you know check the the do a little bit of homework right check on the community check on the uh, who is contributing. Even where where are, where are they when they are contributing? Uh, you know, maybe you want to check if they are coming from some areas or some countries that you don't want you don't want to deal with, right? Or or uh, you know, may have a, a greater risk. So I'm just gonna uh, end here this, and I can talk for two hours or more on this, right? Just a, a couple of quotes here. Uh, open source security is about visibility of the vulnerabilities. Uh, you have to apply the patches, avoid end of life uh, versions. And, and making those scans, those security scans, part of your development lifecycle, right? Uh, the more automation, the better. Moving from DevOps to DevSecOps. Uh, whether it's rewriting code, pair programming, or learning from fellow developers, uh, humans will not be replaced by generative AI, right? Only enhanced, uh, and that's my measure. Right? Take advantage of the new tools. They're, they're great, but you need to know what you're doing, right? You need to make sure that, that you treat this properly. Uh, take advantage of the new tools and 3D AI generated code as any other code with bugs and vulnerabilities. So I think we still have some time, a few minutes for uh, some questions, uh, Philip. I, 
leaving here my my contact details and uh yeah some of those cool images were ai generated cool images for sure for sure <laughs> thank you very much for that presentation learned a lot um we do actually have a, a couple of questions in the chat um the q a session is now officially open so if you have any other questions for javier uh now is the time um but the first one that we have uh from gocon says how do you evaluate open source software for DOD use perspective? Uh, the code is open to the world, i.e. the Chinese can see it. How do we prevent use of open source code, open source code with millions of lines? Yeah, big question. Uh, first of all, DOD or any other government agency, they're all using open source too, for sure. Now, there are obviously different ways to do it, um, one practice that I've seen in, in, in different places is the use of um, uh, repositories, the use of uh, um, kind of like trusted source. So, by the way, these repositories could be open source, as open source, the, the, the functionality or, or not, right? Um, repositories like um, Artifactory or Nexus or others were... Uh, you know, only the code that it's been vetted, that it's been tested, that it's available in the repo, and then your developers are not going to go outside or to the internet, but can get the code from the trusted source. Um, many uh, government agencies also work with trusted source, you know, third parties, right? And they said, uh, the company where I work for, uh, we get these requests a lot where uh, you say, well, look, yes, I know I can take it from the open source community, but I rather get the same software from you, right? And and you be the trusted source. And yeah, there's a dependency there on a third party, but there's someone that can go and validate and provide technical support and uh, and so on. Um, I, I think this is an interesting challenge, right? And you don't want to fall behind. Uh, um, uh, because you know the innovation and a lot of the new software uh, innovation is happening in the, in the open right everything that you see on cloud native you know it's it's coming from open source software all the built-in blocks of ai they are also open source frameworks you know pytorch tensorflow and you know i don't know how many libraries out there many python libraries out there for ai so um Make sure that you vet that, make sure that you provide the, the scans, and then each agency will have their kind of like their own mechanism to to authorize access or distribute some of that software. Thank you. Uh, our next question from Steve. He has, can you recommend tools for checking dependencies that are out of date? Uh, pretty much every tool does that. <laughs> every open source tool uh, does that. They are maybe, 10 different commercial offerings out there. I was talking to an analyst from Forrester uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and she was telling me that, yeah, it's a crowded space. There are a lot of uh, uh, commercial versions. And as I mentioned on the slides, there are also open source versions. They're like free, free, free versions. Um, one, one differentiator, I would say, aside from like UI and, you know, maybe uh, functionality to create policies and things like that, um, one difference obviously is the database, right? Um, if if it's comparing against only the national vulnerability database, or if it's comparing against the national vulnerability database plus some additional vulnerabilities identified by the vendor, uh, so that that's that's another interesting piece there. Uh, and yes, you have to scan everything. Like you have to scan all the software that, that you have, and not only for on the open source third party libraries, but also on your your own code, right? And that will be on the and what is called a static analysis uh, testing as well. Perfect. Our next question from VO. In the case of malicious code, is now good math, especially probability and statistics, knowledge required for these hackers to manipulate since the AI engines are mainly the applications of probability equations? Yeah. So. Yes, I mean, I kind of agree. Yes, the, 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 you can get a lot more uh, smarter or, or uh, you know, with these tools, you can start doing uh, more sophisticated things. Uh, I would just rephrase that as not only the bad actors, but also the good actors right? uh, can take advantage of, of the tooling. Yeah. Great. 
Um, as of right now, I see I see some com some compliments as well, some comments in the chat as well. I don't see any other uh, questions. Um, but with that said, I, I would like to address a couple other things. As far as uh, today's slides, we have some small updates, but you can access uh, the slides via today's webinar announcement. I put that um, link into the chat. Um, as far as the recording of this webinar, that will also be up to today's webinar announcement uh, within a day or two as well. Um, someone asked about CLPs and CA CEUs, um, CSIAC as well as DS and HDIAC. Um, we are not necessarily accredited as an educational institution, so we don't provide CLPs and CA CEUs directly. However, we do believe that our webinar series um, is applicable training, and we encourage you to submit those for CLP CEUs for uh, whatever certification body um, that is out there. We are actually in the process of um, creating um, a workflow to make sure that we provide um, certificates to all of our live attendees of our webinars. We'll probably be rolling that out next month. Um, but if you require proof of your attendance um, um, on an individual basis, you can just reach out to me directly and we can kind of work that out in the meantime. But um, but just keep an eye out on that. We will be providing certificates to attendees moving forward. Um, but with that said, I, I'll wrap it up for today. We're right at one o'clock. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Perez again for a wonderful presentation and please check back for uh, the slides as well as the recording. Thank you, Mike. Thanks all.